<clears throat> excuse me. Man, living at altitude with such low humidity makes it almost impossible to shake a cough at the end of a older flu. So please excuse my coughing. Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started here. We're going to expand on some of the things that um, that we actually saw uh, on the quiz, that the end of the quiz um, had a couple of what we refer to as aldol condensations. We covered briefly in class, although it takes it to an, a, um, uh, another level by turning it into an alkene. Um, and then we're going to talk about how we can sort of control that in uh, if we have a mixture of out of um, of carbonyls, um, how do we how do we control which molecule crosses with which molecule? Um, but first off, random quiz questions and some relevant ones. Um, why exactly is it bad to stand in front of a microwave while it's running? Well. You don't want to. You don't really want to heat your um, your cells. Microwave radiation is not that dangerous, other than the fact that it can that it warms water and other organics up. It, microwaves are um, in the are, are in the IR region, and so a lot of organic materials will absorb um, microwave radiation. But that's what that mesh on the front of the microwave door is for, and the fact that the microwave generator is actually in the side. It's per, it's parallel to the door. So if you're shooting microwaves sideways and you have that wire mesh in the front, there's a very, very small window that those microwaves could actually pass through. Um, so in the past, when they didn't understand how to do the safety side of things as much, um, it could be a little bit dangerous to stand in front of a microwave because you could actually burn yourself. Um, but it's really not uh, not a bad a big deal anymore. I, um, I I remember running the numbers at one point when I was probably when I was in college, um, and I believe that you get more dangerous radiation um, from standing outside for an equivalent amount of time in sunlight. Um, then you get from standing directly in front of a microwave. So as long as your microwave still got that mesh on the front, not a whole lot to worry about. Um, although there was a really cool video I saw the other day. Um, let's see. Nile red plasma microwave. Um, where a guy, a YouTuber named Nile Red, who has some really cool um does a lot of really cool chemistry stuff. Um, and he takes a microwave and initially just films it from the outside, um, makes, finds a way to make plasma inside a microwave. And then he actually, and he goes through the science of what's happening. Um, it's mostly that you wind up taking oxygen and converting it to ozone and taking ozone then plus nitric oxide can react to make some other stuff. Um, he then workshops his system a little bit better so that he can film from the inside, he drills a hole in the back. Um, and then all you really need to do to make plasma in a microwave, you don't mind losing the microwave is you trap a gas um, give it a little bit of flame to start it. And then when you turn the microwave on, that went too fast. Um, there's a good one. You can actually make a plasma um, that consists of the oxygen and the nitrogen gases reacting with each other. Um, if you can keep them contained, then you don't even ruin the microwave too badly. Um, but just kind of a cool. Um, Cool video if you have time and you're into watching science stuff on uh, um, YouTube, you could do far worse than that one. It's a pretty good video. Hmm. Um, 
So if you do that to your microwave, then you might you might be doing something that you don't want to stand directly in front of it. But if you're using it for normal purposes, you're probably fine. Um, the book says we can use chlorine for acid catalyzed halogenation of ketones of alpha carbons. Um, chlorine is generally going to be more reactive than bromine. So with bromine, we still have to worry about getting getting the right number of bromines on the molecule we want to look at. Um, and you know, so you're really going to get a variety of products because sometimes you're going to need a brominated more than once, and you have to be careful with the stoichiometry. Um, chlorine is probably going to be more of an issue with that. Uh, chlorine is just not as commonly used because nine times out of ten, if we're halogenating something, it's on the way to doing something else to it, right? Most of the time, the purpose of halogenating something is so that we can then now we have a good leaving group in a specific spot and we can either have it go through an elimination reaction um, or we can do a substitution reaction. Um, and chlorine is not as good as bromine for those purposes. Generally speaking, bromine is better because it's a better leaving group. So you can use chlorine for those if there's a specific reason why you would prefer chlorine to be there. If you're not gonna have it go, then go through an elimination or a substitution. Um, but in general, bromine is more commonly used for that reason. Um, how do we avoid mental burnout? Only a month to go, really not even a month anymore, right? After today, after the end, after uh, today you're done with week nine, which means you have weeks 10 and 11 of lectures and then finals week. Um, remember, it's only three more weeks. You can do anything for three weeks, right? Um, and on the flip side, get enough sleep. It can be um, decide where you are willing to, to give. If you've got too much stuff on your plate to get everything done, then you need to prioritize and decide that you're okay with, hey, you know, I'm not gonna get that makeup paper in my history class done. I might get a B in history. Um, make those decisions, make them conscious decisions so that you don't wind up trying to do everything and not doing any of it well. The worst case scenario is if you try to do everything to keep an A in all of your classes and still see your friends and family and still go to work and you wind up with none of it going well because you're too tired to do any of it properly, right? So if something has to give, make it a conscious decision. Um, so you can decide what's most important to you when it comes to these sort of things. And along with that, get enough sleep. Um, avoid screens half an hour before bedtime and you'll sleep much better. Um, ideally, after like 9.30 at night, you, sh you should not be looking at screens, um, especially screens up close like your phone. Um, I know that's not really realistic. I watch Netflix until what, far too late at night um, myself, but it does help, especially as you're getting burnt out and tired. Um, and to go along with making conscious decisions about what's okay to give up, not give up on, but where you're okay to make some sacrifices, um, make, make that time that you gain when you make that decision, like, okay, I'm not gonna finish this assignment because I just need more sleep. I'm gonna not finish this paper for, for history or that lab for OCHEM because I need to sleep. And if you do make that decision, follow through and actually get sleep. Don't waste all the time on, on, your, on YouTube or something screwing around on the internet um, when you said you were, doing, you were giving up on an assignment so that you could sleep. Make sure you sleep. Anyway, that's just my two cents. Your mileage may vary. Um, I just, in particular, when I was in my third year of college, I took, um, advanced organic chemistry, advanced biochem, physical chemistry, and multivariable calculus all in the same semester. I had 16 units of upper division science and math. Um, and considering I was a chemistry major, I had to make the decision, like, if, so, if I don't get one of my classes homework done, it better be calculus. I only was taking calculus because I was a math minor. So if I was going to get a B in the class, it was going to be calculus, not my other classes. 
And when I, as soon as I made peace with that, it made it a lot easier coming down to crunch time to, to prioritize my time, make sure I got things done that I needed to for my chemistry classes, because those are the ones that I cared about more. Um, after making an enolate from a ketone with strong base, can you have an oxygen attack by the enolate toward the positive end of the carbonyl? It's definitely possible. Um, the oxygen with a negative charge in the enolate is not as good of a nucleophile as the carbon with a negative charge. The carbon with the negative charge is a better nucleophile, generally speaking. Um, and, and this really only happens if you have, if you still have some of the ketone around, right? The, we don't really see this happening, an enolate attacking another enolate. You can make the enolate and have it attack the, a ketone carbonyl, but you're not going to have an enolate attack another enolate because enolates in general are far better nucleophiles than they are electrophiles. They're not a very good target for a nucleophile because there's a negative charge on that molecule. Even there's, though there's a small partial positive, on the carbonyl carbon, that's not nearly as strong as a full negative charge on the oxygen or the alpha carbon. So it's possible, but really only if you still have some of the ketone around, which is why if we use LDA to make the enolate, we don't wind up with these condensation reactions happening. Then last but not least, why do some things smell longer? than others, mostly because they either get lodged into the fibers of your clothing or your hair. In the case of smoke, smoke is actually tiny little particles that are constantly giving off um, molecules that smell, small, small amounts of volatile compounds. Um, and so smoke tends to get lodged in the fibers of your clothes, in between the threads of your clothes, those little pieces of material get stuck in between the threads. And that, that's why smoke continues to smell in your clothes for a long time, because you need to actually wash it and get all of those particles out. Some things like perfumes and, and some fabrics, um, some organic materials are actually slightly soluble in, in the fabric themselves or in your hair. And so that means, um, um, that means that it's going to take longer for them, for those molecules to continue to evaporate. And it all, it all has to do with how large is the vapor pressure, basically. A small vapor pressure for these larger molecules means they're going to evaporate slower at room temperature. Um, it's just that some molecules in particular, some essential oils especially, our noses are really, really good at detecting at very low concentrations. So you can have them evaporating very, very slowly and yet still smell them pretty continuously because your, your nose is pretty good at detecting some molecules all the way down to, um, down to the parts per billion range. Um, you know, we're, not, we're clearly not as good at it as, as dogs, but um, our noses still are fairly sensitive to some molecules. So part of it is that um, with perfumes is that they pick molecules that our noses are sensitive to. And then they tend to have a low vapor pressure as well. So it takes them a long time to finish evaporating. So it's really two different processes with perfumes versus campfires, which I thought that was a really interesting question. Um, for that reason. All right, quiz questions. Um, in general, you guys did really well in the quiz. Um, we didn't explicit, explicitly talk about how acid derivatives also have alpha carbons, but I think everybody was able to make the extension that if you have a carboxylic acid, it's got a carbonyl that has an alpha carbon. And so the similar reactions can happen, except that we, in the case of 
carboxylic acids. We wind up using a Lewis acid to make the bromine a better um, nucleophile, better electrophile, excuse me, um, just like with aromatic reactions, right? In order to make the bromine better at attacking that alpha carbon, which is going to, that alpha carbon has a partial negative on it due to the resonance structures and the, the enol form that it can take. So exposing it to bromine with a Lewis acid means you can brominate that alpha carbon. Um, I think you guys all did the enolate section well. Um, with the possible exception of a few of you forgot to write your charges. Remember that the enolates are always going to have a charge to them. So for A, you would wind up making this molecule. Or you could leave it as the carbonyl and put the negative charge on the alpha carbon um, as a valid resonance structure as well. So that molecule counts as well, as long as you don't have two negatives. All right, but you, you, if it's an enolate, you're not going to have an OH group. That's the enol. You are going to have a negative charge instead because you've lost a hydrogen. Um, to that strong base. And then for aldehydes, we really only have, for all three of these, we only, only have one choice where we're putting the negative charge, where we're putting the new pi bond, right? Because if it's an aldehyde, you can't put a you only have one alpha carbon that you can use. You can't put the negative charge on the hydrogen because the hydrogen already has, if it's bonded to the carbon, it already has two electrons, right? Um, so you would wind up, in this case, if we we're putting the negative charge on the carbon for each of these, It's going to be on the alpha carbon that's that has room. Remember, the alpha carbon has to be able to give up a hydrogen to do this. So you can't put it right there. That benzene carbon already has four bonds. None of them are hydrogens. It's never going to make a, um, you're never going to put an enolate with the negative charge on that um, benzene carbon. Here on the other end, on the benzylic carbon for C, there is room for that negative charge. All right, so this last one, we, we went over these reactions briefly. If you have a ketone that's exposed to an, a base, this, you know, normally hydroxide, we think of hydroxide being a strong base, but not, not in the context of OCHEM, because a lot of these compounds that we're dealing with have pKa's that are above the pKa or in the same ballpark as the pKa for a hydroxide. Um, so if we expose these to sodium hydroxide in heat, we wind up making a mixture of the enolate and the ketone. And if we have a mixture of the enolate and the ketone, we wind up with a really good nucleophile and something that has a nucleophilic target still. And so you did not need to show for, the, for this question, um, it just said, what's the product? You didn't need to show the mechanism for the whole thing. Um, but essentially you wind up turning that ketone into an alcohol and then have it act as a leaving group and you wind up making 
um, a carbon-carbon double bond. So we're going to wind up, sorry, at this, you're going to wind up um, replacing the ketone that's still there with a carbon-carbon double bond. So it's attaching to the alpha carbon. And again, I, we will do more practice with this in a second, but essentially, you attach the carbon, where the carbonyl is attached right now, it attaches to the alpha carbon of another molecule. Which means your product of the of the heptane, you're going to wind up attaching. So here's our alpha carbon right here. We're going to attach that alpha carbon, the pi bond to carbon four of. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We wound up, we wound up with this molecule for, for number one there. Right, that's the final result. And we can follow it the whole way through as a, as a mechanism. And, and again, none of the steps are that different than things we've seen before. It just, our end result looks a little odd because it's a way we have of linking these two molecules together. And we wind up with that oxygen acting as a leaving group and, re and forming these pi bonds because this gives us now we have we have conjugated pi bonds. If we left it as the intermediate, which would look like this, that doesn't look like it's that unstable of a molecule but it's not as good as being able to have conjugated pi bonds. So in an acidic environment, we can, this can still be protonated. Actually, we're in a basic environment. So either way, um, we can wind up with this acting as a leaving group. Um, and you wind up with an elimination reaction happening to make the alkene. Right, and so the other molecule here that looked like this, we're attaching the alpha carbon from one molecule where the carbonyl for the other molecule was. We wound up with this molecule. And just um, one more good quiz question somebody asked, how would we go about naming this? Um, well, when I looked at that question, my first thought immediately was, there's got to be a common name for that molecule. We're not naming that using IUPAC. Rules. There are rules, IUPAC rules for naming um, fused rings. So this is what we call a fused ring structure because it's not two ring structures attached with a single bond. It's two ring structures stuck together. Um, and so fused rings like this, especially aromatic fused rings, tend to have common names. Um, in particular, this is an indenone. specifically to indenone to indicate where the where the ketone is. It's on um, it's one indenone would put the ketone right here. So two indenone puts it on the on the opposite side from the benzene ring. And comes with practice really you, you wind up with enough time you wind up being able to 
could guess, like, I bet that there's a common name for that molecule and just go build it in Moleview and check it. <laughs> However, that's not what I want you to do on the test for nomenclature sections. Just a good reminder, if I give you a molecule that has a common name that we've never talked about, I don't want your comment that common name to show up on your test. I want you to show me that you know how to name it the right way. Um, in particular, this showed up on the midterm with um, is it uh, methoxyphenol was the one I was looking for. That at, that has a common name. So if you put in oops, methoxyphenol and go to the um, information card, you get Gaiacol, Gaiacol probably. Um, which does have pharmaceutical prop properties. I did not want you to write Gaiacol as your name. You're not the only one, Elki. Um, so I want the IUPAC names for these for the most part because I want you to show me you know how to do it. Um, um, although the, this one, I was not expecting this one to have a common name, but that's, I do that on purpose on some of them just to see, so I can tell who's Googling things um, and who's actually um, following our rules. I will intentionally give you a structure where our IUPAC name is wrong. According to, if you just Googled it, you would get a different structure. Um, teachers are tricky like that. Um, I believe that actually Gaiacol is actually related to, I can't remember what the name is. There's um there's a compound that they put in um in Robitussin in cough syrup that's uh, called an expectorant um that's related to this molecule, I think guan guanciferine or something like that. Yeah, something very close to that. Um that uh is very good at helping you cough up, you know, all sorts of um nasty products of having a cold um that uh, i believe it's related to that compound hence the shared name it's something very close to that all right any other thing anything else on the quiz before we move on like i said i think you guys all did pretty well on it i'm not real worried about about this you guys know the drill at this point how to study for my for my quizzes and uh read the textbook um, so you guys are in the home stretch with, in that regard when it comes to new material. Yes, it is the active component of mucinex. The whole thing um, about mucinex, mucinex whole selling point is that it helps you um, either blow your nose better or cough up random crap that's that's in your throat. Um, and they call that an expectorant because when you if, um, expectorate, that means hawking up a loogie in medical terms. Um, and you can remember that if you, like me, grew up with watching Beauty and the Beast and other Disney movies, Gaston's song, right? I'm especially good at expectorating. Um, my daughter's going through a Beauty and the Beast phase right now. We watch either the animated version or the live action one about once a week right now. Um, so I've been thinking about that clearly. All right, let's talk about what happens when we have more than one carbonyl compound at the same time. If we have more than one carbonyl compound at the same time, we can actually wind up with these condensation reactions happening, um, but you wind up getting what's called an, a crossed aldol reaction. So an aldol reaction, it's referred to as an aldol reaction because you wind up making something, it's an aldehyde with an OH group on it, hence aldol, right? 
again, organic chemists are not particular creative with their names. An enol was an alkene with an alcohol. An enamine is an alkene with an amine attached to it. An aldol is an aldehyde with an alcohol attached to it. Um, we wind up, a lot of times we wind up with, with wide variety of products when we do this. Um, and if there's any better way to get to these products, we almost always are going to go a different route. Um, because if you wind up with four possible ways to combine these two uh, aldehydes, that means that at the very best, we might be able to get 25% yield. If we're trying to make this product right here, our very best possible yield would be about 25%, right? Because statistically speaking, if all four of these mechanisms are equally probable, then we're gonna wind up with about 25% of our, of our starting materials actually turning into um, the compound that we want. Um, and we can figure out what all the possibilities are just by it's a little bit like those free radical reactions where you had to draw all the possible ways that you could dibrominate something. Um, you could, if you had the red molecule turning into the enolate, then you could have it attack another red molecule, or you could have it attack one of the blue molecules that stayed as the aldehyde. Um, if we want to use this reaction synthetically, we need to come up with a way to control this a little bit better. At the very least, we want about 50% yield. If we could get it down to only two possible products, then all of a sudden 50% yield is, is reasonable. It's still less than ideal, but if it gets us to something that's a hard, really hard molecule to make, it still might be useful. Um, so the two ways we can control this is one, if we use an aldehyde that has no alpha carbons, if one of our reactants has no alpha carbons, we don't have to worry about it being turned into the enolate, right? And so the two most common are benzaldehyde and formaldehyde. Trying not to sneeze. Um, so if we use formaldehyde or benzaldehyde, well, if we look at these two this reaction down in the, at the bottom here, we only have one molecule that has an alpha carbon. We've got an alpha carbon right there, which means we have an enolate that can form with a negative charge right there. which can then attack the carbonyl carbon for the benzaldehyde. We're still gonna wind up with some mixture of products a little bit because it could also, depending on which, um, which reactants we use, you could still wind up with that molecule attacking itself to form a, um, to form another crossed aldol. In that case, we'd wind up with it forming let's see. That molecule would be a side product. But we can control that a little bit better. If we're down to only two possible ways to do this, we can control that a little bit if by controlling the concentrations. If we have a lot of benzaldehyde and just a very little amount of our propanol, then that means that when, it, when the propanol gets converted to the enolate, it has a much larger chance of running into the benzaldehyde than it does another propanol molecule. So being able to control, 
which one is turning into the enolate and then being able to control which one it then runs into by use of, of the concentrations um, is some of the experimental considerations we would do there. We would make sure that we had a lot more of the benzaldehyde compared to the propanol. We don't need to worry about the benzaldehyde forming an enolate because it has no alpha carbon. So we can have as much of that as we want without it reacting with itself. And then, as we mentioned before, if you make the aldol, it then turns into an alkene. We see this fairly often. Um, once you make the aldol, it rearranges itself and goes through an elimination, um, if possible, to, to make the alkene. So in order to do that, though, we are somewhat limited because you have to have not just one hydrogen on the alpha carbon, you have to have two hydrogens on the alpha carbon in order to have it rearrange as the alkene, right? You have to be able to give up one hydrogen to make the enolate, and then you have to be able to give up another hydrogen to have it go through the second elimination step, right? So we lost one of the hydrogens to get to this intermediate. We still have to have another hydrogen there in order for it to then go through another um, elimination step. Right, so you can wind up with the aldol as your final product if you don't have two hydrogens on the alpha carbon. Um, and we see the same thing oops, with formaldehyde. If we use formaldehyde as one of our uh, one of our reactants with propanol. Formaldehyde has no alpha carbons. Therefore, you're going to wind up with, with it forming the, um, you're only going to make the enolate out of the propanol. And in this case, this is one that does not rearrange as well because we'd be making a only a di-substituted alkene and di-substituted alkenes are not as stable as tri-substituted alkenes. Um, I'm not specifically going to test you on that. I would expect you to normally take this and then finish the rearrangement to make the alkene. Um, but it turns out experimentally, we don't actually see that. When we use formaldehyde, it stops at the aldol. The other way we can do this is if we do it in steps. This is an even better option um, is to not mess around with using sodium hydroxide. So if we want, if we want to do a, a reaction like this, where we um, like the ones from the quiz, where we want where we want one of the molecules to react with itself to do this, this condensation reaction, then we would use sodium hydroxide because that leaves us with a measurable amount of both the enolate and the ketone still around. But if we don't want it to react with itself, then we don't want any of the ketone around. And so what we do instead is we use LDA. Remember, LDA makes the enolate not in a... Um, reversible reaction. It doesn't make an, a mixture of the two, of the, alke of the ketone and the enolate. You only make the enolate. And it's actually stable enough that we can isolate it and then use it as another reactant. So if you do it in steps, if you take your first material and expose it to LDA, you make the enolate with no acetone left over. Then you can introduce your second molecule that that's the one you want to act as the, to be attacked by the enolate. So this gives us a way to control which one is reacting which way. This is the best way to do it, this directed aldol addition, because this means we don't have four possibilities. 
right? If we're controlling which enolate we're making, that, can, that means we're controlling whether we're using, which of these two possibilities we're using as the nucleophile. And if we're controlling which of them is the nucleophile, and we know that we don't have any excess left over of the other of that molecule as the ketone, we can basically say cross off the reactions of it reacting with itself, which means we get to pick just by picking which order we, we react these in, we can pick which of these molecules we make. So this means that the synthesis in lab, the practical side of it is a little bit more complicated because you can't just do what's called a one pot synthesis. If we wanted to make this molecule, we don't have to do things in multiple steps. All you need to do is add benzaldehyde and propanol with some sodium hydroxide and heat, and you're gonna get it. It happens all at once. The reactants can all be mixed together without needing to do separate steps or any purification along the way. So a one pot synthesis is good from a, from a um, logistics point of view, especially in a lab where you don't wanna have to do multiple steps. But on the other hand, you kind of get a mess of stuff a lot of times and you're limited as to what you can make. And it really is a lot like the difference between, um, you know, in, cooking food, if you throw everything into a pot, into a casserole dish, and you stick it in the oven, and you let it cook, you might get something really tasty. Um, but on the other hand, your flavors might be a little bit muddled. Versus if you took time to cook all of your ingredients separately, and then combine them on the plate at the end, you can still get a very distinct flavor of your peas versus your meat versus your potatoes. You just make a casserole with it, you're, you're going to get a little bit of everything, right? So having that additional control is more work, but gives us a lot more control. Don't get me wrong. I love a good casserole. Um, although you can't call it a casserole if you're in, the, if you're in Minnesota. Um, they don't have casseroles in Minnesota. They have hot dishes. Technically, there's a difference, but I can't remember what it is right now. All right, so if we wanted to do that directed aldol reaction, what would we react and in what order to make this molecule? And so we can go through this. And I'll work through this one, and then I have some more um, that we can, that we'll have you work through um, as practice. So first off, remember that the, the molecule that keeps, the tricky thing about this is it looks like we, we went from having one alpha carbon to two. Now this carbon in the middle is alpha carbon to two different groups, right? But the, the molecule that keeps the carbonyl is the molecule that was the enolate. So you want to probably want to start with figuring out, okay, where did I cut the, where do I cut this molecule in half? I could cut it there or I could cut it here. Either way, we're cutting the alpha carbon off from the carbon that has the oxygen. It's just a matter of remembering that the atom that keeps the carbonyl was the enolate because the enolate attacks another carbonyl, right? So we started with This was our enolate. And the rest of the molecule it was a carbonyl before the enolate attacked it. All 
right? So breaking it up into its constituent pieces is one of the trickiest things here. Figuring out what went with, with what to begin with. I'm actually gonna erase the red one real quick and move it out of the way so I can, can write the... And if we're trying to work backwards to make the, that enolate, we started with that molecule without the negative charge basically, right? So if we start with this molecule, Expose it to LDA. That gives us the enolate. Then we expose it to butanol. And we wind up breaking the pi bond, turning it into the alcohol. So we wind up with an immediate intermediate that looks like that aldol, which then depending on the conditions, we could get through, go through a dehydration reaction. And a, a lot of these depend, getting it, if we wanted to stop at the aldol, rather than have it continue to rearrange, it depends on the conditions a little bit. Remember going back to elimination reactions, we could favor the elimination side of the equilibrium by increasing the heat, right? If we increase the heat, we made more separate molecules. So increasing the heat favors higher entropy, which means separate molecules. So we could get the aldol to then go through the elimination reaction by adding heat to it. Um, but if we wanted to stay as the aldol, we would wanna do this at low temperatures to try and minimize that elimination. All right, so you guys try some. Work backwards from these. What were the pieces that reacted together to make these this is after it's gone through the elimination reaction. So first things first, go back and add the OH group so that you can see what pieces you're working with and, and break them up into the separate molecules that you would have started with and pick the right order for them. I'll give you guys a few minutes to work on that. Actually, we'll write it at 8.50. So let's say tack five minutes on to our break um, for you guys to work on this. We'll come back at 9.05 and we'll work through this.
All right. As we're coming back here, working on this, thought I could clear up a few things I mentioned earlier. There is a difference. A hot dish is a subset of casserole. Casserole is just anything you cook in a casserole dish, right? But a, a hot dish specifically has to contain a starch, a meat, a canned or frozen vegetable of some sort, although it can be fresh too, and a creamy soup generally. So the classic example is tater tot hot dish, which is delicious. It's a cream of mushroom soup, ground beef with some carrots and, and peas or green beans, usually canned or frozen. Um, and then you cover it with tater tots and cook it in the oven. Um, so the difference between a hot dish and a casserole is a hot dish is typically an entire meal in one casserole dish that you cook in the oven versus a casserole can just be like creamed corn is a casserole or green bean casserole or something like that. So anyway, uh, and the other thing, where did the other, my other window go? Um, the, it's guy, guy Finison is related to Gaiacol. Gaiacol was methoxyphenol. If you take that phenol and you turn it into an ether, you get guaifenesin, 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 I'm not sure about the pronunciation, um, which is a stronger expectorant. They're, they're both expectorants, um, but guaifenesin is actually found in also in tobacco leaves, which I didn't know, um, which is one reason why um, people that are taking up smoking cigarettes, which is a bad idea, typically wind up hacking up a lung um, or spitting a lot as they're learning how to, to smoke their cigarettes um, because tobacco leaves have an expectorant in it. Just interesting side notes, right? All right, let's talk about these. these reactions. And I also wanted to clarify that an aldol condensation means specifically that it goes through the rearrangement, um, or sorry, the, through the elimination reaction, it goes through the dehydration reaction at the end. Um, the, and as I mentioned, controlling the temperature allows you to make the, you get the aldol addition reaction is when you make the aldol, um, and if you do it at low temperatures, you can isolate the aldol. But if you do it at elevated temperatures, you get the condensation happening where you, where you do the addition followed by a dehydration reaction to make the alkene. And so for these condensation reactions, before they go through the, the dehydration reaction before they go through the condensation, they would have looked like A would have looked like this. So it's always on the beta carbon is where the or alcohol is. In, in these before they go through the rearrangement. So if this is the alpha, that's the beta. So that would have been for B. And C would look like Would look like that. Now, once we have that drawn, we can split it up and turn it into okay, what would the pieces of these be? So, for the first one, we're cutting it in between the alpha and beta carbons. So those are where 
the molecule would be cut to start. And then it's just a matter of figuring out what pieces we have. So remember what whatever was remaining, whatever stays as the ketone, whatever stays as the carbonyl was the enolate. So for A and B, this is where we're opening a ring, a ring opening reaction, right? So we are going to wind up with this being part of the same molecule. So it's not going to be specific that important. Um, and let me. So for A, we wind up making a symmetrical molecule that has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. And it's got a ketone on carbon two and carbon six. So if you let this molecule react with itself, you will wind it wind up with it going through the aldol addition where you wind up with the alpha carbon attaching to the carbonyl carbon on the other end. And then the resulting molecule goes through the condensation process where you make the alkene. Would it be reasonable to have that alpha carbon do the reacting? Did we have that happen? I think you could, but I think that you were saying the carb anions are opposite of carbocations, so it'd be more likely that you'd make a carb anion on a primary carbon. Yeah, so the stability of the carb anions um, would would be better, it's more stable to have the enolate as the negative charge on the primary carbon compared to here. The other thing to consider with these ring opening reaction or ring forming reactions is, are we gonna make a ring that's too strained, that's too small? And I believe we made a ring that was one, two, three, four. We'd wind up making a four-sided ring if we did that which is going to be less stable. We would wind up making So that would be our carbonyl. Yeah, it's it's going to wind up making something that's really really unstable if we try and do it that way. bunch of methyl groups plus too small of a ring structure is less than ideal. We want, it would look like, just for the sake of practicing our ring formation reactions, we'd make a four-sided ring and on one carbon you would have you would have that um, an ethanone sticking off the side. And then that would make this the alpha carbon and this the beta carbon. So on the beta carbon would be where you had the OH. And then there was another methyl still sticking off of that. That doesn't look like a particularly stable molecule. Um, in theory, you might be able to make some of it, but both of our rules of stability would favor making the other alpha carbon into the negative charge and forming the six-sided ring instead. 
right? And again, your double check for this, if you did your ring formation properly, is make sure you have the same number of carbons. We should still have seven carbons. And then it's just a matter of what's attached where that, that you would want to practice. So five is another, or sorry, not five. Uh, B is another ring closing reaction. It's a five-sided ring this time. We only have a total of six carbons instead of seven. And one of them is an aldehyde. So we cut, cut it right here and turn that OH into a carbonyl. And again, it's a primary carbonyl, so we wind up remaking the aldehyde. So we wind up making one, two, three, four, five, six. This molecule. So our alpha carbon that did the reacting. There's only one alpha carbon for each of these aldehydes. So there's our alpha carbon that does the reacting and it's gonna come in and attach right there to turn that into the five-sided ring structure. One, two, three, four, five. Then you still are gonna wind up with one carbon with a carbonyl hanging off of that. All right, last but not least. We have this um, crossed aldol condensation happening. We're cutting it in between the alpha and the beta carbons. So the, enol, the enolate that did the reacting would have just been acetone. We took acetone and exposed it to LDA. We make the enolate. And the enolate could then attach to benzaldehyde. We wind up forming this, this um, cross aldol addition product. And because of the extra conjugation you get, this one's going to rearrange itself really quickly. We're never we're not going to be able to isolate this one. Because if we if we go through that um, elimination reaction to make our final product. We're going to wind up with so turn it into ah. our final product, we can tell looking at this, there's a lot of resonance here, right? We've got our benzene ring conjugated with the pi bond from the alkene, conjugated with the, with the remaining carbonyl. So we wind up with a lot of extra conjugation. If you left it as the OH without going through that elimination reaction, you don't get all that extra conjugation, right? Because you wind up with an sp3 carbon in the middle. They can't do any con they can't do any resonance.
So you wind up making a very stable molecule if you have it go through the dehydration reaction. And so that's why these aldol condensation reactions, the, the elimination step is a lot easier than in regular elimination reactions because we're making something that is conjugated. Even if it doesn't have the benzene ring, you're still making a pi bond that's conjugated with the, with the carbonyl. And as you start getting into these longer and longer conjugated molecules, you start seeing things that, um, I don't know that this is a biological molecule, but I know that a lot of compounds related to dyes or a lot of compounds related to, um, to sight or uh, color in organisms um, tend to have these long conjugated chains. So I would wager that this is a molecule that has some common name, mostly because I bet it's going to be, it's used as a dye in some form. Um, I know in particular, like vitamin A is just a big long chain of a alkene, an alkene that's, or a polyalkene that's got a whole bunch of conjugated pi bonds in a row. And that's what allows it to absorb in the visible region um, and why it's so useful for sight in humans. Our eyes use it. Um, to absorb light in certain wavelengths. All right, so questions on these examples. All right. We can also see these, these condensation reactions happening with esters. They actually do something very similar. Um, they even ha they have a, already have a better leaving group, though. If you already have a better leaving group than a hydroxide, then you still wind up making this um, these molecules where you have the alpha carbon acting to attach to other molecule but if you make if you have the this is the enolate and it's going to be attaching there instead of it'll initially form a tetrahedral intermediate just like the other acid derivative reactions we've seen um, but once it does that you wind up with an intermediate that would look like winds up looking like that's now this is our alpha carbon we wind up making a molecule that looks like this as our intermediate and that means it won't stay it also will go through a a sort of con, uh, condensation reaction where instead of kicking off an entire water molecule, you wind up reforming the carbonyl and kicking off the ethoxide because you've got a good leaving group here. And so that'll wind up giving you this molecule where you wind up adding a ketone in the beta position, beta carbon, um, to the original ester. Right. And so this is what's called a Claisen condensation. A Claisen condensation takes an ester and converts it into um, a beta dicarbonyl, a beta unsaturated dicarbonyl. All right. And so then you would wind up following that up with an acid um, just to protonate here to stop the reaction from happening so that you don't wind up with the enolate. Um, making that uh, doubly stabilized enolate. But here's that tetrahedral intermediate where you've got the beta car or the alpha carbon from one of your esters attached to the carbonyl carbon from the other ester. And 
and again, get a pretty good yield with this 75% yield for a reaction that seems this unlikely. Esters are already pretty light or pretty, um, pretty stable compounds. And this is technically, this is a reduction reaction because we're taking one of the esters and we're replacing a carbon oxygen bond with a carbon carbon bond. So 75% yield for something that seems pretty unlikely is actually a pretty good yield. All right, so let's do some practice. So identify the base you would use for each of the following transformations. All right, and so the reason that this is important is we want to make sure we use a base that matches the other side of the ester. We want our base to be the same leaving group as what we originally we eventually pull off, or else we're going to get um, side products or we've converted this ethoxy group on the ester into something else. If we used um, hydroxide as our base, we'd actually wind up making products where we just converted that ester into the carboxylic acid. So we need to make sure we pick a base that matches the other side of the ester, the, the other side of the ester, the side of the ester um, that we want as our leaving group has to match our base to limit the number of side reactions. So for A, if we want, if we want to turn this ethyl propanoate into this more complicated molecule, we want to go through a Claisen condensation where we're turning one of the esters into um, a ketone, we need to make sure our base matches our leaving group. And this is our leaving group. So for A, we would need to use sodium ethoxide as our base. Because if we use sodium ethoxide as our base, you're going to have some reaction that looks like the ethoxide acting as a nucleophile coming in here and attaching. And you're going to wind up making some inter amount of the intermediate that looks like this, and then kicking off one of your leaving groups and turning it back into an ester. But if both of our leaving groups are the same, then it doesn't matter that the, this reaction is constantly happening, but it doesn't matter. It's not going to affect our product at all because we're, the product of making this reaction is the same molecule we started with. Right? So that's the whole point of picking your base carefully is that you don't wind up with this other reaction making a difference. It's happening, but it doesn't change anything. So if we use sodium ethoxide as our base here, that, what that base is going to do is on some, of, on some of our molecules, that base, that sodium ethoxide, you wind up with the alpha carbon keeping the extra pair of electrons, the ethoxide grabs that hydrogen, you make the enolate. It's not technically an enolate at this point, but it looks very similar, which can then, now you've got something that can come in and attack another ester molecule at the carbonyl carbon, right? So it's technically not an enolate, but the practical result of it is that it's something that looks a lot like an enolate except with an ester instead of a aldehyde or, or a um, ketone. All right, and make sure I'm, yeah. 
exactly the way they show it as well. So if we were looking at B, if we wanted to, we wanted this molecule to go through a Claisen condensation, we would need our base to look like the leaving group. So we would use T-butoxide. So potassium, butoxide. And just for the sake of not putting KT next to each other, a lot of times we write it as, we write the TBUO first, even though traditionally in ionic nomenclature, we would always write the positive ion first in organic chemistry um, so that we can make it clear that this is tert butoxide. Sometimes we write it this way. We'd still say potassium tert butoxide. We'd still say the name potassium first when we write it this way where we're putting the potassium with neck right next to the T doesn't look right. So unless you're going to put um, parentheses around it or something, it uh, makes more sense to write it this way. But again, I'm not going to be that picky about it. You could also just draw it. It's very common practice in organic chemistry to just do to do it like this. Or you write out your reactant that way. Sure, we've we've seen that before, right? Or even just leaving off the positive charge. Just know that the positive charge has to be there in order to add the T-butoxide. Um, but we don't necessarily need to draw it. So this would be the base we would use. All right, now I'll give you guys a few minutes to practice this. Predict the major product obtained when the following compounds undergo a Claisen condensation. Actually, I'm just going to rearrange this a little bit for the sake of having room to work here. And just as one more aside, I did look up that compound that we made that was very conjugated. And it does wind up having its own, it's not really a common name, but it does wind up showing up in nature, um, having that uh, 
all the that conjugated bonds. It's actually used as a fragrance um, and it's produced naturally by uh, black diamond moth because um, it's an inhibitor of certain enzyme of those insects. Um, and you can actually look up what it smells like, even though it's not that common. It's, and it is a colorless to slightly yellow crystal and solid with a sweet, pungent, creamy floral odor. So when the when chemists do get flowery with their language, uh, no pun intended, um, you do wind up with these sort of convoluted descriptions of what it smells like. All right. So if we're going to have these go through a Claisen condensation, we're going to be attached attaching or the alpha carbon for each of these. To the carbonyl carbon from another one of the same molecule. So for A, remember that part of one of these is not changing. One of these is staying the same structure. The other one is losing the, the ester and becoming that, and the carbonyl carbon becomes the beta carbon to the remaining. So you're ripping off the ester part of the ester and attaching that carbon to the alpha carbon of the remaining ester. And actually, I can we can do this a little bit better if we see a little bit better what's happening. Color code it. I think you can see it better. There's our new bond. The other molecule. There's the remaining carbonyl from the other molecule. And then it had, it still has an alpha carbon toward a benzene ring. Right. So if you have a complicated ester, you wind up making a doubly complicated product when we do this. So it's becomes tricky to keep track of everything. And Let me to, okay, good. Just had a bit of a panic attack. I realized I need to um, figure out my intro to Gen Chem quiz before they can start taking it. So I had to make sure it didn't go live at 8 a.m. this morning um, for them. So I can make sure I double check their questions or they would have been very, very confused because they changed up the order of the material this year on them. Um, anyway, back here, we have a Claisen condensation for B. There's our alpha carbon. So on the, <clears throat> the alpha carbon from one is attaching to the carbonyl car carbon from another one of the same molecule. So one of our esters is not changing. The other one is losing the methoxy group. And the carbonyl carbon is now the beta carbon to the existing carbonyl. So we're adding a bond at the alpha carbon and keeping the, keep, or keeping the carbonyl at the beta carbon. Then it's just a matter of remembering to draw the rest of the molecule. So from the, it was one, two, three. So one, two, three.
No, I lost a carbon in there, didn't I? Yeah, because it's one, two, three, four. See, even I can miscount. Right. And then once you get it drawn, you may want to clean it up to put all the reactive groups in the same spot. That's not totally necessary. If we wanted to clean this up, we could write it as our ester. One, two, three, four. And actually, it's probably better to put the T butyl group facing the other way. And put your diketone. And if you're trying to get fancy with your color coordinating, this is where it can get tricky. One, two, three, four. And one, two, three, four. So something like that be the most convenient way to write it so that you could see it, see the entire oops. so that you could see the entire group here um, the most important functional group put it all together that way but again not totally necessary you could have it arranged however you want as long as you get all the right bonds where they need to be <clears throat> if we wanted to do this with c do this one more time for practice there's our alpha carbon it's so attaching the alpha carbon to the carbonyl carbon from one of the other molecules. And the carbonyl carbon then has five carbons in a row, one, two, three, four, five, with an ethyl group on carbon two. All right, and ideally, if you do this right, you should be able to identify, right, there's the exact same molecule we started with, just missing the F oxide. And here's the exact same molecule we started with. One of them is not changing. One of them should be the exact same molecule you started with, and the other one is the exact same molecule minus the F oxide. It's just where you attach it that gets to be tricky, right? but you should still be able to identify both pieces of it, um, ideally without even color coding it, but that can be really helpful. Keep track of where everything's coming from. Questions on this slide? I think all of the places that I mixed things up, I caught them as I was going, so I don't think I gave you, I did anything wrong. Um, for these. Would that be an anhydride? It would not be an anhydride because an anhydride has an oxygen in between the two carbonyls. So an anhydride would look like this. So the fact that we have a carbon in between the two carbonyls makes this really sort of something else. 
It is a a beta keto ester or something along those lines. We would, we would name it based on those two separate functional groups. It's no longer, a, it's not a diester because you don't have two ester groups. You still have one of your ester groups that then has a ketone. And if we were naming this, we'd name it as an ester and then we would say that it has an oxo. The prefix for a ketone is oxo, O-X-O. So we would name it just like it was a ketone and this molecule all of a sudden gets very complicated to try and name as a ketone because we wind up with a lot of complicated branches. We would name it with this as our parent molecule and then but with complicated branches and then it's an ester and then we we would name the ketone part of it as an oxo prefix. So it would be something along the lines of, so one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's the wrong place to put that. Heptanoate. And it's going to be a, One, two, three, sorry, three oxo, five ethyl, two parentheses, one ethyl propyl. Yeah, heptanoate, that would all be the base molecule. And then you would have a separate word because it's an ester that would just be ethyl, three oxo, five ethyl, two, one ethyl propyl heptanoate. We actually do have the tools. If you know about using this prefix, we actually do have the tools in IUPAC to name this because IUPAC naming is just building on the same formula, right? It gets really complicated in this case, but it's doable. And like I said, there in the textbook, if you look at the end, the appendix has a list of what is the how would you name an aldehyde or a ketone as a substituent? You name it as oxo. Um, so again, I, that is way more complicated than I would ever ask you to do on a test. And realistically, the only place you would see that named like that would be um, in a peer reviewed journal article. Real, realistically, if that was a molecule that had a valid purpose in somebody's lab, if somebody's lab used that molecule all the time, they're gonna, within their own lab group, they're gonna have their own sort of shorthand to referring to it. Like for instance, um, a lab group that I worked with in grad school used trimethyl aluminum a lot, but we just called it TMA, right? So there's, if that molecule wound up being important, they would give it their own nickname, even if it didn't have a common name. So, um, but we got a little bit, a little ways away from our, your original question. Um, last thing in the last two minutes here is we have plays and reactions can also be crossed condensation reactions where you pick and choose where you mix two molecules together. It doesn't have to just be the ester reacting with itself. A crossed condensation reaction is gonna look very similar. Um, if you use an ester that doesn't have any alpha carbons, then that can't be your enolate. But the better, the more powerful way to do this is use LDA on an ester to form the enolate and then mix in your other ester to get yourself that clays and 
condensation happening. Right, so use the LDA to make your enolate, then your enolate can come in here and act as a nucleophile, kick off this OR group and make our new molecule. All right, so changing the order of those would change which molecule you got. Right, so controlling the order of what you mix with the LDA first and then expose it to the other ester controls what you use as your nucleophile and what um, stays as the ester. And we do see this within the same molecule and they actually call it a Diekmann cyclization make a cyclic beta keto ester. Um, and that's similar to the reactions that we undid earlier. If we have a alpha carbon five or six carbons away from another carbonyl, then the diester can turn into a cyclic group. All right, so we'll stop there. And that's most of we didn't quite get through the very end of this chapter. Um, so I'll make sure that the quiz questions reflect that. Um, but you should be able to identify, to cut it up into its individual pieces and what order you would need to mix them in to get these crossed clays and condensations, just like we did with the crossed, crossed aldol condensations. Right. And then the flip side or the other piece to that is if it's making a cyclic group, if your alpha carbon is five or six carbons away from another carbonyl, you can wind up with that cyclization happening. You should be able to take those pieces and turn it into the cyclo group. Okay. And so, um, you know what we'll do for the quiz? Uh, so it'll still be set up as a quiz, so I have time to format things, um, but it's going to be these two questions and then one of one of the cro a crossed aldol condensation question. Um, so just practice with these, just like last week's was just a quiz. Um, one file upload with three different questions with some practice. Um, do, we're going to do quiz this week will be very similar. All right, so watch for that this afternoon and everybody have yourselves a fantastic weekend. Get some sleep, catch up on any assignments you have outstanding. I'll see you on Tuesday.